Okay, good morning everyone. So as uh, the assignments are here due up at the front of the class, uh, also electronic assignments, if you're submitting and cho or choose to submit electronically, you don't have to. Um, if you choose to submit electronically, they're also due around about this time now. So give or take uh, this next hour, we expect the electronic assignments to be due. Just one thing on the electronic assignments, I, I obviously understand that with this course there's some calculations and there were sketches asked of you in this particular assignment. If you ever need to in, include that in your electronic assignment, um, feel free to scan those in or take, take a photo of them at, at make sure though it's at good resolution so that the T and myself can see it and embed that in your document. Um, but here's one way that an electronic assignment is not valid. If you take this copy and you scan the entire thing and simply include that, and the, now we end up with three digital images inside a document, that's not acceptable. The reason is quite simple. The purpose of the electronic assignment is so we can comment on the exact part where your error is. Google Docs allows me to highlight a word or a letter or a paragraph and comment on that. But I can't highlight a part of an image and give you feedback on it, okay? nor can the TS. So just taking your document, scanning it in, and submitting that electronic is not a valid electronic assignment. And we will reject that and expect that to be submitted in paper form. Yes? Um, can we convert that same format into PDF and send it to No, it's the same problem. Okay, Google Docs only allows you to select on the word or on the text. You can't select images. Okay, so as the course website says for electronic submissions, no PDFs. Okay, for that same reason, because we can't comment on it. So if we can't give you feedback and comment on it, it would be like us just returning your assignment back to you with no feedback and comments. That's not what, what, why we do assignments, right? Okay, does that make sense? Yes, no? Comments, questions, any? Because this electronic process is new for you guys. Any, any feedback, comments on it, problems that you faced with it? Okay. Nope. Okay, the fact that there's, there's a whole lot more paper here than I expected, but uh, that's, maybe you'll warm up to the electronic version later on as the course progresses. The fourth year students in 4N are 100% comfortable with that now. Okay, so maybe, it, maybe just something to think of. All my courses uh, do allow electronic assignments, so as you get used to that, it, it helps things. Okay, let's, uh, let's finish this section up um, that we, we were looking at yesterday. We were looking and considering the shapes and the flow patterns in a sedimentation vessel. And when we left the class yesterday, I mentioned that sedimentation vessels, when we're looking at them from the top, have two shapes. They're either circular or rectangular. Those are the two configurations we'll find in practice. And the main issue that we're facing is when we're feeding the material and in the circular tank the feed is right there at the center and the material flows in a radial direction to the outer edges. So if you're looking at it from the top perspective that's what it looks like. Um, let me just perhaps I was going to switch to this later on but this is a good point now to take a look here at this drawing. This is from Perry's. That resource I told you is freely available to you from the library's website. So as you can see here, the material is fed at the top. There's polymer injectors. Your feed is coming in at the top, and it's dispersed here. And that feed will flow in a radial direction to the outer edges. Okay, that's there, the effluent weir and the effluent launder. So that's taking the, f the overflow, the liquid, out. The solids settle down to the bottom. There's this rake that we spoke about, and the solids are withdrawn through those two points at the bottom. In a rectangular tank, you would pick one side as your feed, so the material is fed evenly distributed at that one edge, and then your overflow launder and weir is over here on the other side. So the material is simply flowing across, and the solids are settling down. We're only looking at the top view here, but the solids are settling downward and collecting at the bottom, and there's a conveyor belt to remove that as well. Okay, so that's the principle of operation of those units. What I'd asked you to consider last class, though, was the two velocity vectors that we're dealing with. The particle settling with that velocity V that we've covered now in quite some detail over the past few classes, as well as the, the horizontal fluid velocity. So in, the, in this 
in this rectangular geometry, that fluid velocity in the horizontal direction is easily calculated. We know Q, the flow rate coming in. So that's Q, the flow rate, vol volumetric flow rate in meters cubed per unit time. So let's say meters cubed per minute, for example, is Q. And we also know the cross-sectional area. The cross-sectional area, all this liquid Q needs to flow through some you can just visualize some arbitrary vertical line there and all that fluid has to flow through that cross-sectional area there. And so Q divided by this cross-sectional area, let's call that A cross. So Q divided by A cross-sectional area is equal to the velocity in the horizontal direction. So V horizontal okay so the horizontal ve velocity can easily be computed in that way so we what we're aiming for is that any solid particle coming in in that inlet region you've got to make sure that this flow rate this Q is slow enough that the material isn't simply going to follow the trajectory by my laser pointer so let's watch here you don't want this happening that this material follows a trajectory and sort of lands up over there. So if your horizontal velocity is really fast, that solid particle is going to get to the end and simply get sucked out in the overflow. And you've not really separated too much. If your horizontal flow coming in is really slow, that particle is going to take a trajectory and land up here in your sludge zone. And that's okay. It's going to land up in your sludge zone, but then really the rest of this region in that rectangular reactor is essentially unused. Okay? You've, you've built this unit far too big than what you need because the particles are settling so early. So we designed this unit with just the right distance so that those particles at least land up somewhere over here in the bottom and are not sucked out in the overflow. Okay, now take a consideration of this. If you decide to double the depth of that vessel, convince the person next to you that a particle coming in over here is going to land up there, and a particle coming in here of the same diameter, same density, is going to land up at exactly the same point in the horizontal direction, whether that vessel is double the size or half the size. So convince each other that that's true. In other words, doubling the depth has no effect. Hey, Carlo, can I ask you not to sit here? Because if you bump this, then the whole lecture is destroyed for everyone else watching the video. OK, thanks. Okay, everyone comfortable with that concept? Yeah? No? Okay. Anyone want to explain it? No? No one wants to explain why that's true? Who, who gets it? <laughs> okay, so here's, here's, the, here's why this seems counterintuitive, that if you double the size of your vessel's depth, it has no effect. When you're doubling that depth, the cross-sectional area through which that, that Q has to pass, so this flow rate Q, now instead of passing through that depth, is now passing through a larger depth, the velocity in the horizontal direction is halved. Okay, so it's, it's, it says it there, the horizontal vel velocity is halved, so the particle has got to travel twice the depth but half, it's going at half the speed. So it's going to land up at exactly the same point. Okay. So by going to build a vessel three meters 
deep or six meters deep, that extra depth is not buying you any benefit. Okay, so it's it just comes from a simple volume balance. That volume Q coming in over here has to travel through this entire tank, whether it's traveling through a tank of this height, let's say that that's three meters, or if it has to travel through a height of six meters, all that material, that volume, if you do a volume balance, Q in, Q out is the same. Okay, so the velocity has to halve, and so the particle ends up at the same point. Now, in a circular vessel, there's a slightly different flow profile. As I mentioned in class yesterday, there's a radial profile because if you look at a volume balance now, your volume balance is going to be considered through a ring around the center over there. And the material passing through that ring in red versus the material passing through this ring in blue, the ring in blue has a larger cross-sectional area. So the velocity through, through the blue hypothetical ring is smaller than the velocity through the red ring. So we get, in fact, sort of like a quadratic drop off there in the velocity profile. And so if we plotted the trajectory of those particles, it follows that arc shape. The key of all of this discussion, though, is we really want to make sure that our particles have a residence time. And I know you're comfortable with that word residence time from reactor design. That react, the residence time in that reactor, this is not really a reactor, but a sedimentation vessel, that that particle stays there long enough to settle out. Well, how long is long enough? Let's take a look at some guidelines of typical vessels. Typical wastewater vessels have um, two numbers that they really focus on. One is the surface overflow rate, SOR, which tells us how much liquid comes out of the vessel per day per meter squared. So 40 meters cubed of liquid, that's 40 tons of water per day can be processed for every meter squared of surface area you have. So think of one of those large circular vessels. There's a high surface area there. Typical overflow rates are 40 tons of water per day per meter squared that they can process. So that gives you some guidance there. Secondary units. These are units that are further down in the flow sheet. They're processing lower volumes, 12 to 30 meters cubed per day per meter squared. Okay. Vessels typically, you'll find, are around three meters in depth. The, uh, sorry, not typically. The minimum depth is three meters. And that comes from, that's the, the depth that you need for that particle to at least reach the bottom. So that's one guidance there. You wouldn't design vessels shallower than three meters. But also, beyond a certain point, as we showed, it doesn't make sense to double the depth or go to larger and larger depths. And these vessels, if they're, if they're in a circular configuration, should have a diameter that's at least six meters. So it would be typically built. And there's some, some aspect ratios, length to width ratio, um, if you're building a rectangular sedimentation vessel. Yes? So it's further down in the, in the flow sheet. There's less solids that are being treated because the primary unit will treat a, a higher rate of solids. OK, so when we talk about retention time or residence time, typical numbers are two hours for the solids. So each solid particle is, with, is in that vessel for around that duration of time. You will need longer times if you're dealing with very small particles or in winter time. Okay, so winter times, we've got lower temperatures, densities and viscosities are slightly modified, so we need slightly longer times for settling those out. This 10% uh, number here, uh, if you'd like to add to your notes, it's 10% by volume. So if you take organic solids, you can't really compact them more than, than that point. So uh, five uh, wet solids, organic solids, if you compress them, you can't, they're not like a sponge that you can just push down and down. And it, there's a very small compaction ratio there. And the reason why I point that out is to bear in mind that we have to pump that solid material that's leaving out the bottom over there, has to be removed in some way, and we would need to design pumps that can handle that. Um, and, and good pumps for that purpose are diaphragm pumps. So that's just a, a side piece to, to bear in mind with these units. Now, 
We'll also, often in this course, I'll resort to some of these sorts of calculations that show at least what is the main factor that affects cost. And in these vessels, cost is primarily affected due to diameter. It's not the depth of the vessel, it's the diameter of the vessel that, that really determines what the cost is going to be. And we, do, we use these cost correlations. For those of you that are in 4N um, course, you'll see these coming up in a few weeks as well over there. But essentially they say uh, dollars cost is of the form A times X to the power B. And in this particular study that's valid for tank diameters between 10 and 225 feet, so X is the diameter raised to some power 1.38 multiplied by some upfront coefficient A. 1.38. It's larger than 1. That's kind of surprising because most units, the bigger they become, there's sort of like cheap, they become cheaper and cheaper to build. Doubling a vessel often doesn't mean a doubling in cost. Okay? It's kind of like you go to the grocery store or like um, Costco, you buy in bulk and you save type of idea. Same thing for capital equipment. You double the size. Typically, the cost does not double. It's less than double. But here is a number that's greater than 1. So it's telling us that that cost actually increases with diameter at a faster rate. Okay. So, so that's interesting. And, and we can bear that in mind when we're sizing these vessels, that larger is going to cost us more. But one thing that's important is that the installation is so much greater than the actual cost of building those tanks. The concrete and the foundations and the material that goes into the tank itself is, is one cost, but the installation is three to four times that amount. Okay. So if you're looking at pure equipment, what do you need? You need, um, as shown here in this diagram, I'll just go back to it, uh, you need some walkways for, for servicing this device for, for your um, for people to come take samples of the wastewater and to access that motor and maintenance over there. So there's always walkways across these devices. So there's, there's that aspect, there's rakes, there's drive, the drive head for the motor and the motor, um, pumps, piping, instrumentation, all of that goes into the equipment cost. As I mentioned earlier, that motor really just needs to be there to move the solids at a very slow rate. This is not a fast motor at all, um, but it does need to be able to hand the, handle the high torque. So there's a very high torque on that long, long diameter arm from the rake. Typical costs for those, um, uh, sorry, typical motor requirements are very modest, 12 kilowatt motors, rotational speeds. Um, at the tip of the rake, so if you were watching the tip of the rake, it's moving at about nine meters per minute, and that's fairly minimal. The most of your ongoing costs for these units is, will in fact be the chemical cost for flocculation. That's going to be your majority. Okay, so that's, uh, that's really where we're going to leave this topic. I've already looked and shown you the lamella in yesterday's class, I showed you that video. Um, but here's some other designs that you can go look at. Wastewater, as I've said several times in this section, is really a part of many companies' flow sheets, even companies that don't explicitly deal with water. Um, they have water that's being used and needs to be treated before it can be dumped, or water that's internally recycled and needs to be cleaned up. So even if the company might just be in the mining industry or oil and gas, it's not associated with water, there's an internal use and requirement for water and you'll see some of these units. Any questions on this topic before we move to the next one? Okay, I do have some further questions for you to consider with answers in the notes. So work through those and there's that separation factor coming up again. We looked at that uh, last, the week prior.